my brothers and sisters across the continent. Happy New Year. Thank you, Mr. and Mrs. Yoko, for inviting me to share on this platform at such a critical time as this. A time when it seems God is giving Christians an opportunity to provide answers to education, at least on the African continent, as many grapple with how to carry on education. I bring you greetings from my husband, Dr. James Magara, and our children who are aware that I'm speaking to you today. James and I are now proud grandparents of an adorable Jedediah. We have obviously been bitten by the grandparent bug. Uh, he's an adorable little one, and we thank God for him. Now, when Graham and Palm contacted me to speak on the topic, it's a matter of trust. I knew God was affirming what he had been speaking to me all through 2020. It has been a season where faith and trust in God has been stretched to new levels. It has been a matter of trust, nothing more or less. I'm therefore going to share with you uh, my reflections through the year and hopefully um, God will enable us to learn a few things together. Now, 2020 was a year like no other. I'm sure everyone has a story to tell. It was a year where the whole world was brought to its knees, a year where all men, irrespective of stature, of experience, irrespective of where you are positioned, everything was in total confusion and no one had answers. It was a year where renowned scientists, world leaders, organizations and systems all came to a halt. It did not matter where you are, whether you are in Washington, D.C. or in the remotest little village in Africa. The playing field was leveled. We were all groping in the dark for answers. What a year it has been. Um, many of us struggled with uh, COVID-19 as it hit our shores. Um, those who survived it have lived to tell the indescribable trauma. And uh, scientists and politicians across the world have continually and frantically fought to keep nations and scientists and societies afloat. Communities, cities, towns were locked down. Families, individuals isolated and quarantined. Struggling with the, the fact that there was no time frame to it um, and when or how it would be lifted. Now, personally, our own children are scattered around the world. Um, we have four grown children. Um, the eldest is in Barcelona. The second is in Australia with his family. Um, the third is here with us. Uh, we're thankful for that. And then the, the last one is in Canada. Now, for the very first time in our lives, we have been apart for a year. Often we try and meet up once a year, but this last year we're not able to meet. And even now we do not know when we will physically see each other again. And so it's been a very challenging year, um, not knowing what is going to happen next. Our hearts have been focused on him and it really has been a matter of trust. Now, apart from the time of Noah and the flood, I'm not aware of a historical account where the whole world and its system came to a halt. I know that um, there have been pandemics through the years, uh, years past in the centuries past, but nothing like this. And although the scientists are making progress in providing drugs and vaccines to deal with the COVID-19, it's not yet over because the virus keeps mutating. Now, as believers, our help will come from the Lord. He will give us answers. And today I would like to draw lessons from the story of Noah and the flood that's found in Genesis chapter 6 through to chapter 9. Now, the background to the flood is that is found in, in chapter 6. And there was, at the time, a lot of violence, a lot of violence in the land. It seems like all systems had gone uh, uh, haywire, really. Uh, the sons of God, we see in, in chapter 6, verse 2, the sons of God there were marrying uh, the ladies there. 
Now, it seems that the sons of God would, would infer uh, to some angelic beings. If you go to Job chapter 1 verse 6, again you see a time when the sons of God appeared before God. And it seems like God occasionally brought them together. And that's the time that Satan also came and began accusing Job. So there's a reference there of the sons of God. Whether or not this is the same situation here, the sons of God, some angelic beings. Others seem to indicate that it was a race um, that God did not approve of. So anyway, these sons of God were marrying the young, uh, the ladies there and, and having children. And these children were giants. They bore children. In verse 4, we see the children, the Nephilites. That's, that's the, the mighty men, uh, the giants that came into the land. Now, the extent of the evil was so bad, so bad that God, God regretted why he had, um, the Bible says that God was sorry that he had made man on the earth. God's heart was so grieved, so much so that he decided to wipe out um, all those that lived on the land at that time, whether it was man, beast, creeping things, birds, animals, anything that was living. He said, I've had enough of this. I'm going to clear out the whole of um, all the, the living creatures. And verse 9, verse 8 um, is, is one that tells us about Noah, that Noah found grace in the eyes of the Lord. So only Noah was pleasing the, to the Lord. He found favor. He found grace before the Lord. And in verse um, 13 down to verse 33, God reveals his plan in response to the wickedness. He reveals this plan to, to Noah and shares with him what he's going to do. The total destruction of the earth and all that lived in it. And then he gives Noah instructions on how to build the ark. You can imagine at that time, it didn't seem like it had been raining. At least there, Noah did not have an idea of what a flood was. So God instructs him on how to build the ark. He was now 600 years old when the Lord gave him this instruction and he began, um, he began to build the ark. Can you imagine? He was actually uh, not yet 600 years old because the flood came when he was 600 years old. So he began to build this ark. Can you imagine the ridicule he experienced? Can you imagine... The, the questions he probably had himself even as he built this ark. There are things sometimes that God will tell us that we may not fully understand. But may we draw lessons from Noah because he simply obeyed and began building the ark. Now in chapter 7, we, we, we see the flood. Uh, the flood began um, and in verse... In verse um, in verse 5 it says, And Noah did according to all that the Lord commanded him. Verse 6, Noah was 600 years old when the flood waters were on the earth. So Noah with his sons, his wife and his son's wife went into the ark because of the waters of the flood. So Noah goes into the ark with all the animals that God had instructed him to bring in. Two by two was the instruction. Get two by two uh, of the different animals, male and female. And then they went into the ark. And it's important to note that in verse 16, that it is the Lord who shut them in. So really, this was a, a mission. This was a, a work of the Lord. It was not man. He brought the, the flood. He caused the flood. Uh, the, the, he gave no the instructions on how to build the ark and who to bring into the ark. And once they were all in, he shut them in. It rained for 40 days and 40 nights. Every living thing on the earth was destroyed. Only Noah and those who were in the ark survived. And we see in verse 24 of chapter 7 that the waters stayed on the earth for 150 days. So Noah and his family and, and all these animals were actually quarantined for 150 days, five months, total quarantine with animals. 
Can you just imagine what was happening in that ark? It must have been an incredible miracle every day. Trying to feed those animals, trying to clean them. You can imagine cleaning the ark with, with the lions and the elephants and the snakes and somewhere having babies and cleaning out all that. And remember, it was closed in. They did not seem to have any aeration. I don't know how that was working because the windows were, the window that we're told about was closed. And uh, I don't think they would have left any space for, for, for to open up because the rain would have come in. So God performed an incredible miracle every single day to keep all those animals from attacking each other, from eating Noah and his family, or even from suffocating. I don't know where they even got the lighting from. So God performed a miracle in this season that they were locked up. I'm sure each one of us has a story to tell about the last year and how God provided for us and the mirac miraculous things he did to keep us um, alive, to heal us, to deliver us from all kinds of challenges, to provide for us when work came to a halt. And so we see the same God providing for Noah in the ark and making sure that the animals are safe and not tearing each other apart. Um, just even, I just keep thinking about the, the hygiene in that place, how it worked. Only God knows. But suffice it to say, they were in the ark for 150 days. And slightly more, actually, when you go down into verse 8, you'll see what happens. And so in chapter 8, um, God, the Bible says, then God remembered Noah and every living thing and all the animals that were with him in the ark. And God made a wind to pass over the earth and the waters survived and the waters subsided. Now God starts the process of getting Noah out of the ark. It was a process. Sometimes we want instant deliverance, instant answers. God performs miracles. We do not negate that, but Oftentimes, he will work through processes. And waiting in those times of processes can be difficult. Let's see what happens to Noah. In verse 1, we see that the wind, uh, the Lord causes the wind to blow to pass over the earth, and the waters begin to subside. In verse 2, the fountains of the water, of the deep, and the windows of heaven were also stopped. So that was another um, process that God worked through the the fountains are from the from the earth of the water and the rain was stopped and then it took 150 days for the waters to subside enough for the ark to rest on Mount Ararat and we see that um, in verse 4 and then 40 days after the ark had rested on Mount Ararat Noah now opens the window uh, and lets out a raven, which kept going back and forth until the waters had dried up on the earth. You'll see that in verse 7. He then sent out the dove, which returned uh, because it had no resting place. And then after seven days, he sent it out again. Uh, and this time, um, the dove came back with a, a freshly plucked olive leaf, which means that the plants were beginning to grow now. He waited another seven days and sent out the dove again. Um, and this time it did not return, which was an indication that it had found a place to rest. So you have the 150 days in, um, in, in the ark. And then you have the 40 days. God begins the process of, 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 um, of sending wind to cause the waters to subside. The fountains are closed off. The rain stops. But 40 days, they're still in there. The rain has stopped, but 40 days, they're still in there until the ark rests um, on Mount Ararat. Uh, but it still seems like there was still a lot of water because when the raven went out, it stayed going back and forth and then came back. And then seven days later, uh, he sends out a dove. Seven days later, he sends it out again. And this time is when it comes back. Um, it does not return, meaning it had found a place to rest. 
and therefore and then soon after in chapter in chapter in chapter 8 verse 14 we see and 15 we see the lord god spoke to noah saying go out of the ark um you and your sons and your wives and your sons wives you you and your wife and your sons and your sons wives with you bring out with you every living thing of all flesh that is with you and and uh, and so on and so they all come out they all come out of the ark and the bible tells us that noah was 601 years old when he came out so it it was uh, about a year it was about a year in the ark noah's response so noah comes out of the ark builds an altar to the lord and worships him with burnt offerings. That is the very first time we see the word altar mentioned in the Bible, and, and we draw some lessons there. So then verse 20, Then Noah built an altar to the Lord, and took off every clean animal and every clean bird, and offered the burnt offerings on the altar. And the Lord smelled a soothing aroma. Then the Lord said to his, in his heart, I will never again cast the ground for man's sake. Although the Im imagination of man's heart is evil from his youth, nor will I again destroy every living thing as I've done. While the earth remains, seed time and harvest, cold and heat, winter and summer, and the day and day and night shall not cease. So God responds by pronouncing a blessing and a covenant with Noah and his descendants. He also establishes seasons, life um, seasons, day and night, seed time and harvest time, cold and heat, winter and summer shall not cease. Something amazing has happened. God has reset the earth. He has reset the earth. What was before was totally destroyed. He gives Noah in chapter 9, we see a repetition of of the initial instruction that he had given to Adam and Eve. He repeats it, he says, be fruitful and multiply and fill the earth. So God resets the earth, gives instructions to Noah that he had given to Adam and Eve, and then he establishes something new. He establishes seasons and he also pronounces a blessing and a covenant on Noah and his descendants. I have this sense that COVID 2019 was a season, was a, an opportunity that the Lord has used to reset the earth, to reset the systems of the world. Nothing, we are hearing of the word new normal. That's an, a new word now that everyone is familiar with. We're in the new normal. We will not go back to life as it was. And so what are the lessons that we would learn from this time? What are the lessons that we will learn from the story of, of Noah and how God reset the world during that time? Let me share with you just a few lessons that uh, I've, I've been meditating and learning through this period. One is that God is sovereign. He can do anything. He can restart the whole world for his purpose. Just as I've mentioned, 2020 was a year of resetting the whole world and its systems. Nothing has been left the same. Noah had to figure out what to do after the flood. Scripture tells us in, in chapter 9 verse 20, uh, it says that and Noah began to be a farmer and he planted a vineyard. This implies that he was not a farmer before the flood because here he began to be a farmer. His family and the animals had to find food. Remember all the vegetation had been destroyed. And so we too are going to have to begin new things, new projects, new ways of doing things new ways of doing education, new ways of having family. The opportunities are incredible. We just have to look away from the flood and the darkness and look at what needs 
we can meet and there are many many needs we read in uh, in uh, that the second lesson that I, I would like to to draw from uh, this passage is that God is in charge of the affairs of men there was a time in the middle of, of um, somewhere during the lockdown March April when we were seeing images of many dying in in Europe and it felt like we were helpless the sense of despair the sense of helplessness the fear that gripped us it's like who is in charge here but I'm reminded that in Daniel chapter 4 17 it says that God is in charge of the affairs of men. I'd like to turn there and just read that scripture, which, which became a very strong um, encouragement to us during that period. That COVID is not the one in charge of the affairs of men, but God is. Daniel chapter 4 verse 17 says, um, verse 17b, it says that the most high rules in the kingdoms of men. The most high rules in the kingdoms of men. I've just picked out a section of that uh, verse. And so the lesson we learn is that God is in charge. He has his sovereign. He has not given up his throne. COVID has not taken over or the many other things that we have wrestled with in 2020. God is in charge. And then the third lesson is that wickedness will not prevail. God's purposes will stand. We see that in the time of Noah, just before the flood, there was so much wickedness. I mean, we see it all over our continent, all over the world. We hear of stories of, of what's happening around the world, systems collapsing, right is called wrong wrong is called right i mean when you righteousness is scoffed wickedness would seem like it's prevailing but it's not god's purposes will stand and then the fourth lesson is that we his people have a covenant with god we his people have a covenant with god he is a covenant keeping god he honors his word above his name that's what psalm 138 verse 2 tells us that he has exalted his word above his name and so we can trust him we can trust him we have a covenant of peace with him in christ jesus and so because of that covenant we can trust that this covenant keeping god will honor every single word that he has given to us now during this season i kept uh, bringing to remembrance the words that god had given us as a family as a nation as his people who has he has called in the field of education what are the words that god has given you paul admonishes timothy that use use the prophecies to wage war and so I'd like to, to invite you to, to go back through your life and, and check for those words that God has given you. He is a covenant keeping God. He will keep them. No situation, nothing will cause those words to be deferred, delayed, or even denied because he keeps his word. Now, the, the other lesson that I would uh, draw from here is that in the midst of darkness, God's light is shining. Isaiah chapter 60, verse 1 to 2, and I'll turn to it as well. Isaiah 60, verse 1 and 2 says, Arise, shine. Arise, shine, for your light has come, and the glory of the Lord is risen upon you. Isaiah 60. And the glory of the Lord is risen upon you. For behold, the darkness shall cover the earth, and deep darkness the people. But the Lord will arise over you and his glory will be seen upon you. In the midst of darkness, God's light is shining. In the midst of darkness, we, his people, are called to shine his light. And I'd like to just share with you a few testimonies that in this year, when 
um, COVID hit Uganda and we came, we, the nation was shut down in March, our schools have remained open even in that pandemic. The ACE schools, many of them switched to online and have been open in the pandemic. Vika, our school, Vine International Christian Academy, had the largest number of graduates in this year, in all its 15 year history. This is the year that we graduated the largest number of students in COVID. How do you explain that? It's also a year where, when the Ministry of Education here was grappling with what to do, remember that previously, previous to this time, um, homeschooling was something that people scorned. I mean, it was not something that you would wanted to even talk about. But suddenly, the Ministry of Education here started encouraging homeschooling. They actually prepared study parks, which they called home study parks, and were encouraging parents to study, to teach their children from home. Incredible, incredible. They began to call out, uh, to check and call us and say, how are you doing it? A few weeks ago, we hosted some uh, officials from the ministry and from the National Council um, Curriculum Development Center, the, the organ that develops curriculum. They asked us and said, we'd like to come and see how you do education. We would like to see how you do your projects. God is bringing people to us as believers so that we can shine the light. We can show them what he has taught us. There are so many opportunities, I believe, that will all continually open up to enable us shine God's light, specifically in the field of education, pointing out the way that we should go. And so let's, let's not focus on the darkness. Let's focus on the light that God would enable us to do, to, to provide in this season. I also want to, to point you to Habakkuk chapter 2, verse 14, which says, The earth shall be filled with the knowledge of God as the waters cover the sea. That is a promise from God concerning education, that the knowledge of, the, of God will fill the earth as the waters cover the sea. So who is going to uh, convey this knowledge? Who is going to pass this knowledge? How is going to God going to bring this knowledge to fill the earth? It's through Christian education. And so we can hold on to that promise and say, God, you have promised that the earth will be filled with your knowledge. Help us as your agents, help us as your co-workers help us as those you've called in the field of education to to do this that you have already promised in your word and so i'd like to encourage each one of us that let's lift our eyes to god to the god of heaven and earth the sovereign one he has given us his word and he's not man that he should lie nor the son of man that he should change his mind no word of his has ever returned to him without accomplishing that for which it was sent. And so he is a promise keeper. He will keep his word. Our battle, our challenge, obviously, is to keep our eyes fixed on him and not on the flood, not on the deep darkness that is around us. That is the battle we have to face. When you have a sick person in the home, when one of your loved ones has been quarantined or taken ill, or has no food in the home. It's very hard, but the challenge is that we lift our eyes off these things. We remember who we serve. We serve a sovereign God. He's the one who will sustain us in the ark while the world reels from the, the flood and while the world, earth is covered with darkness, his glory will fight for us. His glory will shine over us. So let's keep our eyes fixed on him him uh, the god who never fails he has promised us that his glory will rise over us and we therefore ought to step up and shine he will give us the answers that the world is looking for it is just a matter of trust god bless you and all the best in the new year